We're going to be talking about all things content creation for the Over 50 crew. Hi, I'm Lisa Lacroix. This is the Artful Aging channel. And today is the first episode of Lisa Lacroix Live, except that it's not. Today's show's pre-recorded with our first guest of the show. Today we have with us over 50 content creator, Camille Cower. Camille, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. We met originally on TikTok in the early days of 2020, I believe, and have followed each other, been mutuals since then, and more recently got to know each other more. So I'm thrilled to have you be the first guest on the show. I like to start all of my conversations with people, asking them about something from their childhood that they think has influenced who they've become. So I'm wondering if there's something that occurs to you. I was always kind of an only child in my mind anyway. <laughs> and uh, and so we didn't have, you know, TVs and computers and games and things like that. So I was always kind of an artsy fartsy person. I always played in in the paints, whether it was on a canvas or whether it was on my face. And I really loved that sort of thing. So I was known to paint my high heels different colors and um, and paint my face different, you know, crazy ways. And of course, at Halloween, I was the go-to makeup artist in my community. So <laughs> even when I was like 14 or 15, I was doing everybody's makeup. And my mom would tell people, yeah, just bring your kids over. My daughter will do your makeup. So that's kind of my, my start. That is amazing. And what a perfect example. Because for the people who haven't gotten a chance to experience Camille on social media yet, that's exactly how you started, certainly on TikTok, on TikTok and also on YouTube. So share a little bit about what your social media journey has been. I actually started as a makeup salesperson who could not sell makeup. And, and uh, right about the time that I had started selling makeup, I kept thinking, wow, I really have to get online and talk about these products. And I could not figure out a way to do that without just being really cheesy and salesy, which is not my style at all. So I'm very down to earth, you know, very real. And I try to be completely honest with everybody. So this, the makeup sales wasn't working out for me and the pandemic hit, you know, I'm one of those pandemic stories, like a lot of people. And I heard about this TikTok, and I just kept hearing all these neat things about, you know, how people were just growing like crazy over there. And I thought, well, before I give up the makeup sales, I'll go over there and see what I can do. And then I realized very quickly that I, it was kind of like a finding myself. I found myself. I went back to who I was as a child, really, and kind of rekindled all of those exciting things that I did, you know, with the crazy looks and the hair and the wigs and the makeup. And then I realized that there was this over 50 crowd and really over 40s and up. And when our skin starts changing, you know, we don't always know how to handle those changes. And some people want to continue wearing makeup and some people don't, you know, they just want to give it up and whatever they want to do is fine with me, but I'm here now to help those people to figure out how to handle their adjusting skin. Amazing. It's a beautiful story. And I, I think it really speaks to the fact that TikTok was a very different platform than so many people thought it was in 2020. And I know when I got on TikTok, it was because Gary V made a little short video saying that if you're over 50 and you're not on TikTok, you're missing an opportunity. And that spoke so perfectly to many of the tenets of artful aging that I have, which is one, learn from young people, bi-directional learning. Don't think that we're the be all and end all. Because exactly. when it comes to, yeah, when it comes to social media, for sure, when it comes to the future of where the world is going technologically, the young people are the ones to guide us. So when you said that, that absolutely hit for me. And then add to that the fact that I like to do things that are different. I usually find myself 
on the early stage of things. And even though TikTok wasn't in itself new and we weren't early adopters as far as TikTok goes, we were pretty much early adopters for the over 50 crew. Although the pandemic was an awful, awful period in many ways, you know, it's just like anything else in life, wherever you have struggles, you're also going to have growth. And so we just kind of happened into these, you know, magical places at the right time. Not that it's not the right time now. I don't think it's too late for anybody. Right. So what's your take on that? I know that there was a certain period of time where I thought it was done. TikTok was done because things changed on the platform. The algorithm was constantly changing, as you know, and as anyone who is a creator on TikTok knows, there's this constant sense that I've been shadow banned because my views aren't showing up. That is, I think, a misinterpretation of the constant changes. I think we can so easily get involved in and be impacted by whether we're getting those vanity metrics. And of course, they don't really matter so much. As you and I know, because we've been supporting each other now and being accountability partners for creating content, sometimes we have to get over our own minds, our minds that say, oh, too late it's you missed it no one's paying attention now no point anymore those you know those messages those those noises in our head are so common for all of us whether we're content creators or want to become content creators or people who have a message they need to get out into the world and take up space and start speaking about which is so much my commitment um, you know and and I know yours too you're right. You're so right about the vanity metrics. And for those, you know, who maybe don't understand what we're talking about, because you're new to this kind of thing. It's just where we see these great explosive numbers, like maybe, you know, 100,000 people or 10,000 people saw a video of ours. And it kind of makes your ego explode a little bit like, wow, you know, this is awesome. I must be great. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the next time you're, you, you, of course, expect that to happen over and over. But that's, that's all Lisa's talking about by vanity metrics. It's also the sense that the views are affirmation of the fact that it's making a difference, that you're reaching people. And so for me, a lot of that was the experience that I had in 2020 is I thought, okay, people are finding this useful. I'm going to keep on creating content. And then sometimes in addition to the vanity piece, there's there's simply the feedback loop that feels like sometimes it ends. And then you can get all the noise coming in that says, well, if I'm not being useful to anyone, it's a lot of work to create content. Yes. If it's no longer relevant or helpful, then maybe I should spend my time elsewhere. Yep. Yep. I, so I feel the same way. It can, be, it can be misleading because sometimes the algorithm just changes. <clears throat> right. Sometimes the algorithm just changes and it doesn't necessarily reflect. And then you get to the fact that if you just reach one person and it's the right person, it could make a difference. That's absolutely truth because you can change the world with one person. So, so now you're starting to talk more about what you've learned from being a content creator and sharing tips and tricks and strategies and techniques around the platform. Talk a little bit about what kind of difference you want to make? Like, what's there, what's the why behind that for you? What's the motivation? Is it simply that you have now learned a lot by doing this for a couple of years? It's kind of a combination of things that I've learned and things that I want to tell other people and, and try and help them. And you can't really reach out to any of your friends on social media that are doing the same thing that you're doing, but they don't have you know, the follows or the likes, and they can't figure out how to get their content sort of off the ground, but they still have something that you can tell is really good that they want to say and that they could add. And you can't really reach out to them and say, hey, you know, this is really what you need to do, but you can create a channel and go ahead and make content for those people. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully they'll see it. So, um, that is really, I, so I guess from a helpful standpoint, point. And also just, you know, to have all this really neat information and not have anybody to share it with. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, when I started with the makeup at one point, I thought, wow, you know, I don't have anybody to teach makeup skills to, I have no, you know, girls in my family really. <laughs> so I have no one to teach that to same thing with the, the short form content creation. I don't have anybody to share that with. So it's kind of an outlet for me as well. Yeah, I love it. And you do such a great job of combining entertainment and education, which for anyone who is thinking about getting on social media and specifically getting on short form content, which I think, Camille, you and I both 
we both have a, a soft spot for short form. Yes. And so I, I think it's the time for anyone to get on social media. I think that if you have a business or something you want to impact, if it's a movement or a change or something you want to impact in the world, I think you have to get on social media and you have to do short form content. I think video is increasingly the way that people have a sense that they know you. And those are the people the People they know, like, and trust are the ones they're going to do business with, is the ones they're going to buy products based on their recommendations, is the ones they're going to hire for their work. So what would you say are the important things for someone to know who is considering getting on social media and starting to create short form content? I would say, number one, it's going to take a long time. It is literally going to take a long time. I have been creating content for about a year and eight months now, a year and nine months. And while I have earned from it, I haven't earned consistently and certainly not a full-time income. So know that this is not going to be, even if you have great success right out of the gate, this is not going to be a, you know replacing your nine to five job. Don't quit your day job. Um, also, <laughs> it's a hard road. I mean, it's really hard. Even if you don't struggle with inconsistencies like I do, you will still have a difficult time with this. There's ups and downs. Your emotions will be all over the place. You'll think you're wonderful one day. You'll think you're terrible the next day. You'll think you're over <laughs> at some point. And you'll ask yourself a lot of times, why am I doing this? And you'll have to remind yourself over and over and over why you're doing it and why it's important and that you really should be here and that you really should be doing this. So I think those are two of the most important things. There's a lot of Second guessing, it's really, I mean, I know that people have been creating content for a long time, especially over on YouTube. But the thing is, you know, it's not like something that like when you become a doctor, you sort of know what to expect, right? You know what to expect in terms of how long it's going to take you to finish school. Well, you know what to expect based on whatever your specialty is as to what you're probably going to earn, and this is still sort of a gray area. Like not everybody knows what they should be earning. Not everybody knows not to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I think there's a lot of gray area. And so I think that one of the things that's really helped me is reaching out and forming sort of a little alliance with you, Lisa, and we have been able to help each other. And I've learned so much from you and we've been able to share, you know, things back and forth. So I think it's great to, to make some alliances and it never hurts to reach out to other creators and say, Hey, I'm struggling with this. What do you do? Never be embarrassed. Yeah. Those are some great tips. I think they're really important things. People definitely need to know that it's not a fast thing. It's not a certain thing and it's not necessarily a quick money maker as well as of course, always if you can create connections and community, you're going to be a lot better off. If you have patience and consistency, all good things. All age groups have the perfect place on social media. And I think that everybody should pretty much try to be represented no matter what age you are, because it helps other people. It helps other people so much. We learn from the younger people, they learn from us and vice versa. And so in, in about every 10 or 15 years in, in our lifespan, everything changes, you know, for you. So there's always something available to help you or help you learn something or go in a direction, you know, that you want to go in. And uh, so, so definitely there's not enough people probably from 60 up. I think that the, that the 50 year olds have really jumped on the bandwagon and still there's more room for more. Absolutely. And then, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever. I mean, we need everybody. I think you just hit on something that is so important and that's representation. So there's all the gifts that we want to give. We want to share our knowledge. We want to have the creative expression for ourselves. And maybe there are, maybe there's, you know, you have, you have your products that you're promoting and affiliate relationships. I have my courses and my speaking skills training. But one of the most important things, in my opinion, is contributing to representation for our collective. Yes. Because what gets represented is what gets recognize what gets rewarded what gets compensated there's so much necessity for all communities being represented and i think that it's pretty clear that the over 50 crowd especially for women is underrepresented for how in real especially in relationship to how much we have to contribute right right and how much money we have too i mean honestly mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, and that's important when you get right down to it for anyone who is in the media world, for anyone who is uh, watching creators, for anyone who's using influencers more and more for building their brands instead of the high paid advertisement of the past in the 80s right? and in, in 90s. Influencer marketing is the way things are going. And if you want to hit on a population that has disposable income and that has spending discernment and power, the over 50 women is the crowd you want to be making sure you're speaking to and making sure you are representing. Absolutely. And may I go back just for a moment, if you don't mind, to when you were talking about all the ages and representation for each group. I remember when I, when I was a kid, and I don't know about your experience, Lisa, but you know, I had pretty much one superhero that I saw on television all the time, and her name was Wonder Woman. So <laughs> the thing is, that was the that was the main one like we didn't have a lot of superheroes so and and she was young and beautiful and voluptuous and so if you didn't look like her you didn't really identify with her so as models we're, we're basically models for people who are getting older and we will be from this point probably until we die but as models aging models we represent what is possible for the younger people and they look at us like that they look at us like hey when i get to be in my 50s i want to look hot like lisa does you know or i want to still be putting on makeup every day like camille does or you know something like that so we're and having fun them. with it and having, having fun. fun right and having fun exactly yeah. and and talking about all the things that are important so you know we're their role models so we need those Oh my gosh, it's so important. That is the, the aspect of representation and role modeling because that's the only way that things change when there are examples. And I love that you point out when we were, I, I think we're roughly, I think you're a couple of years younger than I'm 57. You're a few- I'm going to be 56 in a couple of months. Okay, so we're really close in age. So we grew yeah. up in the same generation where we simply did not see ourselves represented. And right. we're talking about being over 50 women, but this is an intersectional issue. So all of the populations need to be represented. It's been so interesting to watch the reactions to the Little Mermaid, a brown Little Mermaid and the reactions, but it's, a, it's an example of the exact same thing. Yeah. And it's relevant because until we're all represented, until everyone is present in the world and, and sees themselves, it has an impact. And some of these videos and TikToks and shorts and stuff I've seen of the little girls watching themselves and watching watching the Little Mermaid clips for the first time and realizing, but she's, oh my gosh, she's brown. Right. She's, it's right. so precious. And right. I think it's it's a it's a really great example of what that looks like uncensored in the pure emotion of it, because that's what kids are. They see themselves, right. in, you know, I think the same thing happens for us as over 50 women. It just, we don't express it in the same way. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, we don't really have a lot of people to look at as, as our superheroes right now. I mean, right. who do we have? We don't have a lot of people. We do have some other social media um, oh, characters, I guess we'll call them characters. Some other social media uh, characters that, you know, are, are definitely 10 years ahead of us that are beautiful role models. But aside from that, all I can think is like Grandma Moses. Yeah. And, you know, that she didn't start till she was in her late 70s. So. <laughs> so I'm sure I'm sure that we have a lot in terms of talking about social media, and because of course you're right, there's all other kinds of ways we can find role models and see representation, whether it's in archetypes or in mythology or in literature or because we're focused right now on social media, I'm going to guess that we share a fair number of the same people, but I'm wondering if we can name a couple of our friends and mutuals and people that we follow. Is there anyone that comes to mind for you that you oh. follow? And you've totally got me at a loss here because I'm yeah. one of those people. I get the deer in the headlights look. Yeah, no problem. I'm supposed to name a name? No, I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> no <awful>. problem. <laughs> I, I knew that that was a risk. 
I knew it was a risk because it put you on the spot on that. And I'm a little bit tough on recall also. There are so many people, right? There and maybe are. I'll even drop a couple of examples of people that I think are worth following in the comments, along with, of course, your socials and mine, the places where where we can um, where we can be found. And that's that's I think that's just totally a normal age thing. We have so much. <laughs> Yeah, we, we do. I think that our brains are like a computer. We get so much in there. It just takes longer to find things sometimes. Sometimes that's right. Yeah. Like, we've got a lot of years of data in there now. To that's make, right. To call. That's <laughs> Including right. a lot of wisdom. <laughs> that's right. That's wisdom, right. experience, information, names, data, all the things. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the things that I was wanting to do on this show is to do some speaking coaching. And I think you are a wonderful speaker. And when we talked about this as a possibility, you said you'd be willing to explore some speaking coaching. And I, and I said, well, I know we all can constantly be improving our speaking skills. I'm constantly working on refining and improving and adding to my speaking skills. But I think you're really quite a wonderful speaker and so I'm happy that you're willing to explore that and you told me that you have some things that you think you would be you could do better in terms of speaking what do you feel is the challenging thing for you because I'm yeah. sure my audience is is looking at you and saying what are you talking about she's perfectly effective oh, and powerful speaker so what, yeah. what's hard for you or what comes up okay here's what's hard for me my problem is when I go to make a short form video, most of the time I'm doing um, an overlay, a voice overlay. And for those of you who, who don't know what that is, it just means that I record the video and without any talking. And then later on I go in and I, I put the words over top, right? So when I go to make a video, I could be saying the most ridiculously simple thing, like this is the best foundation ever, right? Let's see. And then when I pull up my video and my camera here, I'm like, this is the best foundation ever. And I look at myself in the video and I'm like, you look so unnatural. Like I, I don't even look like that. I'll come across so strange. And I will have to say that same thing, like into my camera so many times. This is, and I'll have to look at myself and listen to myself. This is the best foundation ever. Or, and then I'll be like, I love this foundation so much. And it all comes across as so bad. And I'm like, can you just get to the point of what you're trying to say, rather than going through literally 15 minutes it will take me to just get out one stupid thing about a foundation. So that is a problem. Like my, my choice of words I want to be very natural and I don't want to have these long gaps where I want to say, um, um, I know that's a no, no. <laughs> okay. So first of all, let me jump in to say that it sounds like what you're saying is a mindset piece mostly. Okay. Is that right? It's it, not it, that you, it is. Yeah. It's it mostly that on some level you're judging yourself as not looking or seeming natural when I'm going to guess that most people are not thinking that about you because we have a disconnect between the way we see ourselves and hear ourselves and the way other people see and hear us. So that's one piece, yeah. right? So one, yeah, absolutely mindset. And you're so good at, at taking all of my garbly goop and just boiling it down to something simplified like that. So I love that about you. <laughs> so yes, that is one thing. And then the other thing that I, I have an issue with is when I'm live and we've done this, you know, we've even done this today where I wanted to tell somebody that I had gone and seen a concert last night and I was live today on YouTube. And for the life of me, all of a sudden I got the deer in the headlights. Look, I could not for the life of me figure out the name of even the concert that I went to. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it was just gone. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just that I'm so focused on one thing that there is no brain power for the other. And I feel like if I had a filler some sort of a standard filler that would be fine. Like that I could just remember, uh, you know, like in, in movies sometimes, you know, I saw this thing in a movie one time and it said, you know, if I don't know what to say, I'll say, you know, I never did mind about the little things. I mean, just a little <laughs> silly <thing. laughs> 
First of all, let's look at that because it's a it's a common thing. All these things are going to be common things. The mindset piece is so common for people to have that. In fact, that's what I was talking about on my live today was the fact that we put ourselves through and we stop ourselves in so many ways because we're busy judging ourselves. So that that's not going to be you're not going to be alone on that one. And and I haven't really specifically addressed it, but also let's look at now the second thing that you're speaking about which I think is about thinking and being thinking on your feet. Right. Yeah. And how do we respond to it? And and the truth is that we did exactly what I would suggest to people is that we call it out, we say it what it is, we be real, we're like, oh, okay, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Clearly recall is challenging, recognizing yes. it to be true, not trying to, I think what people get into trouble is when they try to pretend it's not happening. And mm. that's when they're filling in all the filler words because they're like, I'm not going to let you know that I don't know what I'm going to say. Right. So <laughs> like you, you know, and so one of the things I coach people on is be willing to say, I have no idea. Be vulnerable. I yes. don't have an answer. Authenticity. I don't have an answer to that question. I am not good at recalling names. And then we go off on another track and we can talk about the fact that, oh, there's something about recall. Like we did. So I love that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that is essentially authenticity is one of the things that more and more is becoming normalized, not only in business, but in social media. And I think it's a great thing. I, I love, I love what you said. That's, that's very helpful. Of course, we want to become more effective mm. at recalling or knowing what we're going to say next. And some of that is practice and self-trust. Mm -hmm. And some of it is letting ourselves, well, you know, if you follow my content, anybody knows who follows my content, I talk about pause all the time. Yes. And being willing to be in silence. And you don't necessarily see it on TikTok because the editing process on TikTok takes a lot of that away because we're trying to be fast and clippy right but to whatever degree possible whatever the the format is being willing to be silent being willing to think about what we're going to say before we say it is powerful and 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 that even is important when we're editing because it's so much easier to edit from pause then from ums and people talking and through blah, 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 and then you're trying to cut it and it's really hard. I mean, you probably have experienced this. Yes. In fact, from listening to you talk about pause for the last month, I have actually started to practice that a lot more and it is so much easier to just slow your words down. Like you said, think about it a little bit more, even if it seems really slow, like the pace that I'm going at now if I will record at this pace and pause in between, then I can edit so much better. <laughs> yes. And, and both well, two things to that. One is that there's so much power in editing. If you were to take that pacing that you just spoke with and were to cut it out, the pauses or the places where you didn't, you know, where you had empty stuff, the pacing is going to seem so much faster, even though you're speaking more, you know, you're speaking more drawn out and you're, and it feels slow and plodding. But the right. other piece is you don't have to speak slowly when you're pausing. So there's a difference between speaking slowly and speaking with clear articulation with sentences that are parsed and pauses in between. Love it. Love it. Love it so much. Yes. That's helped me tremendously. So, and I don't think I've told you that before. So thank you. Yeah. No, you haven't. That's great to hear. I'm really happy to hear that. The other thing is that one of the things I teach people, and this is one of those, you teach what you need to learn things because I have the ADHD like brain and 10 thoughts all at the same time. And usually I'm speaking so quickly and tripping over myself because I'm trying to get them all out at the same time. The pausing and also practicing deciding what we're going to say first is really powerful. So trusting that we can think and make the decision and that when we start to speak, we have an entire sentence mostly formed. Mm, I and like that. that. Trusting. Easier. Yeah. Trusting. It gets easier as you practice it. So much of it is about trust. So much of it is about self-trust. And of course, practice helps self-trust, right? 
and experience, right. which comes Absolutely. back to the consistency thing you and I always are helping each other with. Right. Right. You know, and, and comes back to the content creation piece. I've been on many calls or rooms where content creators say, don't worry about it not being good at the beginning. Right. Right. You think about when you're 500 videos in. Right. Because it's going to be different then. Right. It is. For the content creators that are watching, don't delete your old content because mm -hmm. it's kind of like deleting your baby pictures. You don't want to delete your progress and where you've come from and where you are now. Excellent. I love it. Let's just brainstorm some of the things we've touched on. One is that people need to be on social media. So just when, whatever people need to be on social media, super important because representation matters. Yes. Don't be afraid. We're all afraid. Don't be afraid. We're all afraid. <laughs> Create community link arms with other people. Even yes. if it means on your platforms, because there's no one in your real life doing it. Right. I think that was the, one of the things that we talked about early on was the fact that we, neither of us have in real life friends or community or family. I know lots of people, but I don't know very many that are active content creators. Right. And it can so, really feel like you're living in a fantasy land all by yourself. Uh, one person being impacted makes a difference. That's important to know. Yeah, don't say um without pausing. On both sides. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that one. I agree. With that one. <laughs> Trust yourself, practice, know that the more you do it, the better you get. Well, I, I don't know how much time you have left, but I am honored to have been the first one to be interviewed on your live. I love this so much. I think you do an amazing job and thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to do it. Thank you for all your support. And I will put links in the show notes but or in the comments, but tell people where they can find you, what kind of content they can expect to find on your different platforms and all the things. Uh, you can pretty much find me on TikTok and YouTube by just typing in Camille Cower. So Camille Cower on both platforms and Instagram as well. I do makeup for mostly over 50s. That doesn't mean that if you're 30 or 70, you can't benefit from it. And I do a lot of funny things also with uh, costumey wigs and things like that. So you you won't be sorry you checked out my channel. <laughs> so much fun. And I'm going to take, I think I mentioned this to you before, but I feel like I'm going to take inspiration from you and start playing with wigs because you look like you have so much fun playing with those wigs. They are so much fun. It's like, you know, it's like being a different person every time you put one on, you're like, wow. Well, it's been so much fun having this conversation and I'm really grateful to you. If you're someone who's listening and you're following what we're talking about and you've been thinking about getting on social media, the time to do it is now. If it wasn't yesterday, then it's now. There, It's never too late to, to start something new. You will have so much fun. You will learn so much. And yes, it is a lot of work. If you are interested in, in the basics of TikTok and you haven't gotten on TikTok yet, I do have a course on the basics of getting on TikTok called TikTok Superpower. And I'll put the link to that in the comments. Thanks okay. so much for having me on. Thank you so much. It was so much fun.